Everybody say good morning. Good morning, Bird Street family. Once again, it is certainly glad to be amongst the living this morning. So thankful for those of you who are out there on the conference call and on Facebook Live and any visitors that we may be having with us this morning. You are certainly welcome here this morning. We hope your time here is a pleasant one. As we always do every Sunday morning, would you stand with me as we recite our mission statement? Our mission statement reads, We the family of God's people at 428 Bird Street are passionate in worship, compassionate in service, aggressive in witness, strong in fellowship, and committed to discipleship. Amen, amen. Our call to collective worship comes from Psalms. The chapter is 19 and the verses are 7 through 9. And it reads, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Amen, amen. You may be seated as we go into our song worship service with Brother Tony Wood. Amen. I'd like to say good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, we're going to start off singing. Uh, Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, Amen. and he will lift you. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Oh, and the 
several things in this world. I think about that bush. There's a whole bunch of bushes. But there's this one particular bush that he had selected and he set burning, you know, when Moses came up on it. And he told Moses to take off his shoes because that was a holy ground. That was a special bush that God possessed. That bush was an inanimate object that someone had given life. I think about this building. And people say, that, that's, a, that's just a building. No, no, this is more than just a building. But it has been selected and it has been, it has been dedicated for a particular purpose. Yeah. Now the whole, and this building is in an object. Building itself couldn't could select itself or it couldn't reject itself. Now look at all the people in the world. God has called all, but only some has accepted. The first has no choice, the building has no choice. But we have a choice. 
And I'm reminded that uh, Paul said to those at Ephesus, and I mean those at Corinth, when he's talking about those in Macedonia, he said, first of all, they had given themselves to the Lord. So all the people in the world, and only a few, had accepted God's call. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful to the group that is here. Yes. And perhaps some that are on the conference call and some that are on Facebook that has accepted the Lord's call. Amen. So this morning, I'm just going to give thanks for that. Thankful that God called us and thankful for those that had accepted the call. Yes. And pray for those that have not, that they too will accept the call. Amen. And for those of us that have, that we will recognize it and that we will do what we bring glory and honor to God. May we pray. Thank you, Lord, we be thankful for this day, which is really a blessing. First of all, we are thankful for the blessing that you have sent your call to your creation. And we are thankful that some have accepted your call. And I know some have said that there will be many calls, but there only will be a few that answer. Well, don't let us be, don't let us be discouraged as we Take your word to others and try to let them know about you and the will that you have for us. And when they don't accept it and just reject it, we have to become discouraged and not continue to do the thing that you have asked us set out to do. Because you know what is going on. And you know the outcome of things. But we don't. And as a result, we need faith in you that when we don't see the outcome of things, that we continue to have faith in you. And when things turn out not like we expected, or not like we wanted them to, that we will still have faith in you. We know through your word that you created us for your own glory and honor. As we learn more about your word, we strive to do those things. But we fall so short of your expectations of us. But then again, Lord, Maybe it's not your expectation of us because you know us. And you know our limitations. And we understand in this way that you sent your son that we ourselves couldn't in any way, shape, or form relieve us of our sins. And it is only through the blood of your son that this was done and for this. We do give you thanks. We are thankful for you sending preachers mm -hmm. to this brother Booker I mean, yes. to enlighten us as he has been enlightened by the Holy Spirit to help us to better understand and to appreciate all that you have done for us. And as we understand those things, it, it, it helps us to continue to have faith and trust in you when we look to your word and 
See, all of the people that have served you down through the ages that bad things, and therefore we look at them as happened to them. But Lord help us to understand that we only have for a short while. And that you have placed us here for a purpose. Even though sometimes you do not understand that purpose, again, have us a, give us the faith and the trust to just put faith and trust in you. Because as we look about this world and the birds and the seas and the flowers and just the growth that you have shown to us and the people that you have passed throughout our lives that have reflected a portion of your glory to let us know that you are God, that you watch it over us, and that you care for each and every one of us. Again, we thank you. Thank you for all that you have done for us. Again, help us to realize that things are going what we think are bad. That you can make them good. Yes. And for the most part, even though we don't understand it, we do know that you are in charge, and that nothing can snatch us out of your hand. But we again realize that we ourselves can flee from you, and that if we don't continue to watch for the old devil, that is after us. Again, there are just so many things that we give you thanks for, and there are so many things that are on our hearts. But you know what our situation is. And we have trust that the Holy Spirit is straightening all these things out and present them to your son so that he can present them to you. That you will continue to watch over us, that you will keep it in your care. This is our prayer in the son's name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. 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 Good Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 21. And it reads, Now everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, and cast out demons in your name, and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Verse 25, though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the wind beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. I have your words here hearing Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 29. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, you wanna get right, church, come on. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, let's go home. Good morning, 
at what we have already studied for the last six to seven months on the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, sir. Now that you know what Jesus taught in this sermon, if you had to write a message, what would you put in there about people's philosophy of life? What kind of things do people say is the meaning of life? What kind of values do they have? What, what kind of truths do they have? When you think about what people say, what, would, what are people saying that you know? What would you write about what people say? Maybe they say something like, well, you know, we need to respect other folks. We need to respect our beliefs, and that is true. Or maybe they say, uh, we just need to let people do their own thing. You do your thing, I do my thing. Maybe people say that we just need to let conscience be our guide. Maybe they say, well, you, you don't need to tell me what to do, and, and I don't tell you what to do, and you ought not be so judgmental. Just let your conscience be your guide. You go your way, I go my way. What are people saying about the philosophy of life? Now here's the issue. The issue this morning is, it's all right for you to have your say. It's all right for you to have your belief. It's all right for you to think what you want to think and believe that God knows your heart and God not going to send nobody to hell. And it's all right for you to believe that. But have you ever considered if you compare your standard of living against the standard of someone outside of yourself, what would you come up with? When you compare what you think, what you believe, what you feel, and you compare that to what Jesus said, yes. how would you compare the two? Because what we want to do, as Jesus gets to the close of this sermon, he's now telling us, you're going to have to make a choice. You either want to go the wide way or you want to go the narrow way. You want to go the straight gate or you want to go the broad gate. He said, you have come to the point in your life where you got to make a choice. Now, what choice are you going now to make? So in the conclusion, of the Sermon on the Mount. I want to use for a subject, does Jesus know you? Now I know you may be thinking about that, and, and when I talked to Sister Booker this morning on the way over, and I was sharing with her some of the things I was going to cover, and when I told her the subject, does Jesus know you? She said, yes, Jesus knows me, because Jesus knows everything. Jesus omnipotent, Jesus omnipresent. Uh, Jesus knows everything. He knows my thought. He knows the hands that's on my head. He knows what I'm thinking. Yes, Jesus knows me because he's God. But that ain't really what I'm asking. Does Jesus know you? Let me illustrate it this way. Uh, I know Peyton Manning. Y'all know Peyton Manning? Most of y'all know Peyton Manning. If you know Peyton Manning, you know raise your hand. But let me help you. You know, he was the quarterback for the Tennessee, and then he went to Baltimore coach, you know. And we got all these statistics about Peyton Manning. So you guys know it. I know Peyton Manning. If you were to ask me, do you know Peyton Manning? I would say, yeah, I know Peyton Manning. I, I remember him when he played at UT. I, I remember him when he went to the Baltimore Coast. I remember him when he got all of these trophies and most valuable players. Yes, I know it. But if Peyton 
can't even walk through that door right now. I was saying, hello, Peyton. I know you. And you know what he's going to say? Who are you? He's going to look at me and say, who are you? I don't know you. Because Peyton really don't know me. But I know him. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, the day will come when I will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Now, why did Jesus say that? So let's look at the sermon on the mount. Let's look at the conclusion of the sermon. Because Jesus says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, yes. shall enter into the kingdom of, of heaven. Now just because you say, Lord, Lord, just because you may say, Master, Master, doesn't necessarily mean, guess what, that Jesus knows uh, you. This text that we are reading this morning is probably the most tragic text in the entire Bible. Yes, now you start to think about it. Not every woman that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that what? Doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And many will say to me in that day. Why many, Lord? I think the many in verse uh, 22 is the same many that's back in verse 13. You remember back in verse 13? Many is going to go the wrong way. Now Jesus said many. He said and verse 22 will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Lord, Lord, have we not cast out devils in thy name? Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? Now I want you to notice something in the text. Jesus did not say that they did not do many wonderful works. Jesus did not say that they hadn't cast out demons in his name. Jesus did not say that they had not prophesied in their name. But what they meant was nothing to Jesus. Why? Because they had no real, true fellowship with him. They had no true relationship with him. They had no real connection with him. So they can say, we did this and we did that. In your name, Jesus simply agrees. And he did not doubt their claim that they did all of these wonderful works. Jesus just simply agreed and said, okay, you guys did prophesy. You guys did cast out devils. You guys did do a lot of wonderful works in my name. And that was okay. Because Jesus even said that was going to happen. You remember in Matthew 24? and verse number 24, Jesus said, For there shall arise false prophets and false Christs. And they want to show what? Great signs and wonders. So much yeah. that if it were possible, they would even deceive the very Elect. So Jesus simply said the day was going to come. That these false Christes, these false prophets, are going to do many wonderful works. They're going to do some miraculous things. And Jesus says, and if you're not careful, they will even deceive you as the elect. 
elect of God. But Jesus says, verse 23, Don't mean I'm going to do that to you. 
And just because you curse me out, don't mean I'm going to curse you out. Why? Because I'm going to lead vineyard to the Lord. Now that's part of doing the will. Jesus said, unless you're willing to do my Father's will, you will not enter. Matter of fact, he said, love those that hate you. Do what? This is part of the will. You got to simply love those that don't love you. You show love for them. Give of your material means. You remember we talked about that. Jesus says you need to give. Not let your left hand know what your right hand is giving. He said pray and fast. Yes. This is part of the will. Yes. He says store up treasures in heaven and not on earth. Yes. This is part of doing the will. He said do not worry. But you trust your loving father that he's going to take care of you. You remember he said he takes care of the birds of the air. Yeah. He said look at the lilies of the field. How they clothe. How they spin. How they toil. He said guess what? God takes care of them. And I think I said when we was going over this you need to become a professional bird watcher. Y'all know what that is? Sometimes in the morning, I get up, usually around 6.30, 7 and I go out, sit on the front porch. And one of the things I notice is the birds. The birds. Have they out in my yard? Then I see squirrels running around. And it hits me what Jesus said. Jesus says, Anthony, look at the birds. See how they go out. See how I provide for them. And they just got their pick. I don't know what they eating, but they eating something. They may find a worm here, a worm there. And God said, I'll take care of them. And if I take care of the birds of the air, and you are much more valuable to me than they are, don't you think I take care of you? So let me encourage you. When you get to the point in your life when you begin to worry and you are distressed and you are depressed and you have anxiety, let me encourage you. Sit down and look at the birds. It'll do you a lot of good if you just observe the birds. So we have to then be not judgmental and be not hypocritical. This is part of doing uh, the Lord's will. He said, beware yeah. of false prophets. Do it to others as you would have them to do unto you. And I can go on and on and on talking about the will of the Father. But all of these are the will of the Father. So Jesus says, do the Father's will. But if you don't, he says, you want to say to me, Lord, Lord, and he going to say, depart from me. Who you that worketh in iniquity. The scariest words in all existence is the words I never knew you. Depart from me. I don't know about you, but I definitely don't want to hear the Lord say that to me. I would hate to think that I have went through my entire life thinking that I was serving him, thinking that I was doing what he commands me to do. And finally, in the end, hear him say to me, I never knew you. You preached sermon after sermon. You taught class after class. You did this and you did that. But, but guess what? I never knew you. Oh, what a sad day that would be. That would be for any of us who think we are on the right path, but you have no real relationship with Jesus. Jesus just don't care about you coming to church. He just don't simply care about you sitting on these chairs and singing these songs. He don't simply care 
about you putting money in that box back there. He don't simply care about you taking the Lord's Supper. All of that's well and good. But what Jesus really wants is a relationship with you. Because it's possible that we can go through all of these things. I can sing, I can pray, I can preach, I can give, I can take the Lord's Supper, I can visit the sick, I can preach a funeral, I can do all of these things and still have no real relationship with Jesus. Y'all didn't know that, don't you? He looks at the motives. He looks at the heart. He want to know, Anthony, why is it that you are really doing that? what you are doing. But then Jesus, then Jesus concludes this sermon, some say with a parable. And the parable is this. Verse 24. Therefore, therefore, some say, wherefore, Jesus, because my daddy, my boys cannot say the only reason I'm, I'm in 
Jesus is because my dad is a preacher and, and, and my, my mama is a teacher. Guess what? That ain't going to get it. What God really wants and what God expects of all of us is a faith that is built on a solid foundation. And here's the thing. See, our foundation is here. of our foundation. Amen. Now let me say that again. Your foundation may be unseen to me, but let a storm come your way. I'll be able to see your foundation. You may look at me and say, Brother Booker got a firm, solid foundation, but let a storm come my way. See, you don't see it until a storm comes. And when the storm comes, and if it rocks me and tosses me back and forth, and I just fall, give up, I quit. Guess what? My foundation was not on the rock. Because guess what? It was here. You didn't see it. Y'all ever seen the skyscraper in Nashville? All these tall buildings that's going up. They're going up all over the place. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to work as an experienced carpenter, and they was looking for experienced carpenters to come and help uh, build some of these buildings. So, so I went up, and I got a job, and I was working. Didn't last long, let me tell you that. But I was working, and they was building the foundation. Now, when you look at these skyscrapers, when you drive through the city of Nashville, you don't see the foundation. All you see, 30, 40, 50 stories high. That's all you see. You see from ground level to the top of that building. But what you don't see is the foundation is seven stories. Building we were working on, they dug down seven stories. Every morning we had to take an elevator seven stories deep in the ground. And we started that and we started building the foundation to these skyscrapers. Now again, you don't see, you don't see the foundation because the foundation is here. The reason those buildings stand when the storm of life comes and when the storms come through and blow up against those buildings, they may move. They may sway, but they don't fall over. You don't know why they don't fall over? Because they are built on a solid, deep foundation. And guess what Jesus says our life ought to be like? Our life ought to be built on a deep, solid foundation. Because foundation is so important. Unless you and I have a solid foundation, guess what? Our lives may not stand. Now, most of y'all have seen this building that collapsed in the uh, surf side of Florida. Part of that building collapsed. Y'all seen that on the news? Now, they haven't figured out what happened yet. They don't know why that building collapsed. There's all kinds of ideas, opinions, but no one really knows. I would hate to think that the reason that building collapsed was because it had a weak foundation. Many people lie. Lost because if it was a weak foundation. Unless your life and my life yes. is built on a firm, solid foundation, guess what? When the storms of life come, guess what's going to happen to us? We're going to collapse as well. God wants us to have a solid foundation. Foundation is so important. 
I notice houses nowadays more than ever houses are beginning to crumble walls beginning to crack brick and block beginning to crack have you ever noticed just google this this ain't even in my notes just google the number of foundation repair companies in a hundred mile radius of Shelby. you just google it that's all you got to do you would be surprised at how many companies now is in the business of repairing foundation clock. Because you folk nowadays don't build houses like they used to. You ever went by a place, saw them digging the foundation one day, come back next week, whole house up? I mean, you throw them up. I mean, they come prefab now. But a lot of the foundation hadn't even settled. And God wants us to have a solid foundation. Why? Because the storms are going up to come. So my question to you this morning is, how is your foundation? Jesus warns us that the foundation of our lives are going to be shaken at some time or another. Time and storms of life will prove the strength of your foundation. Yeah. This pandemic that we are experiencing, it has proven the foundation of a lot of Christians' lives. Yeah. They let this, um, this, this pandemic shake their faith. It ought not shake your faith. Be cautious yet. Is it real yet? But don't let it shake your faith. Don't let losing your job shake your faith. Don't let you coming down with an incurable disease. Don't let that shake your faith. Don't let an unfaithful spouse shake your faith. Or an unruly child shake your faith. Let your faith, your foundation be strong so that when the storms of life come, it will not cause your house to fall. Now, how do you build a strong foundation? And the lesson is yours. Building strong foundations. Someone says, you are only as strong as your foundation. The foundation is not doing, but it's your trust in Jesus Christ. That's why I like Proverbs 10 and 25, which said, when the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous is in an everlasting yeah. foundation. The righteous gonna stand. So what we need to do is we need to learn how to manage our lives in the midst of our storms. Because in your storms, of life proves the strength of your anger. The storms of life proves the strength of your foundation. Someone else says not all storms come to disrupt your life. Some come to clear your path. Just remember, church, that I don't care what you go through. I don't care what you may experience in life. Just because you have a storm don't mean that there's something wrong with you. We all go through storms. But I want you to start looking at the storms you experience as those things that strengthens you, that helps you to become more like Jesus. But sometimes we can't live in sin and expect when the storms come that nothing is going to happen. Oh, no, you, you are getting blue over. You are getting blue over. There's a story in the Bible, and it's found in Numbers 
chapter 23, 32. And beginning with verse number 23. Most of you all have heard this part of this verse. Because this verse said you can be sure that your sins will find you out. Y'all ever heard that before? Yes, Let me see the hand. Those of y'all that have heard, be sure your sin. But I know that your sin is going to find you out. But you want to know what? What prompted Moses to say that? You ever really wonder? Now, I do know your sin is going to find you out. Whether or not you're a thief, whether or not you're a liar, whether or not you're an adulterer, whether or not you're a homeowner, it don't matter. Your sin will find you out. You can hide for a long time. But it's going to come to light. Your sin is going to find you out. But what did Moses mean when he said that? Moses said, Reuben got two tribes. They were on their way, the children of Israel, to the promised land. God had told them, he says, now, when you cross over Jordan, I want you guys to fight and, 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 and run out the enemies out of the land because I have a land prepared for you called the promised land. Well, two of the tribes, the tribe of Reuben and the tribe of Gad, they were cattle men, cattle tribes. And when they got to the Jordan River, they decided that they were going to stay on the east side of the Jordan because that's where they wanted the cows to graze and build houses for their children. And they told Moses, they said, Moses, we're not going to go across. Moses said, you hear what Moses said? Moses said, you mean to tell me that you all will sit over here and do nothing? while your brothers are going to war to fight against the enemy. Are you mean to tell me you are not going to help your brethren fight the war? And Moses told them, he says, okay, if you guys want to stay over here, then you first need to go and help your brothers fight the enemy on the other side of Jordan. And once they have driven out the enemy, he said, if you want to come back on the east side of Jordan and set your, your roots, your stakes there, that's well and good. But if you sit here and do nothing, sit here and do nothing, and allow your brothers to go to war. This is what he says. You can be sure that your sin will find you out. Let me ask you a question. What was the sin of God and Ruby? It wasn't that they had committed adultery. It wasn't that they were liars. It wasn't that they were thieves. It wasn't that they was home on us. It wasn't that they had did all of this stuff. You don't know what their sin was. Their sin was doing nothing. Now y'all get mighty quiet. Because what some of y'all are thinking right now. Why is it all the other members doing all the work? Why is it everybody else doing it? I just let everybody else do the work. When we call for volunteers, why is it that only a few shows up and they say, and you say, let them do it. I ain't going to do nothing. Let me carry you. You'll be sure. Just be sure. Don't say you didn't know this. Because Brother Booker telling it to you at 12.05 on July the 25th, 2021, that there is a sin, and that sin is the sin called nothingness. It's a sin for you to sit and do nothing. And be sure that your sin will find you out. So the next time 
We're looking for help the next time. We're looking for volunteers the next time. We're looking for somebody to step up. You remember this lesson. You remember Numbers 32 and verse 23. That if I don't do anything, I am committing the sin of nothingness. And this year, your sin will find you out. Amen. So let me encourage you as we conclude this lesson on the Sermon on the Mount. Build your house on a solid foundation. So when the storms of light come, and when it be up on your house, you'll be able to stand. You'll be able to stand. If you are here this morning, and you need to give your life to Jesus, there's no better time than for you to do that than right now. But none of us knows where death really is. It could be, you could be here today and gone today. Let me encourage you to come to Jesus by faith in him, repentance of your sin. Confess to him before this audience and we'll baptize you this morning. You can leave this place a child of God. Leave this place a brand new creation. And that's what God wants. We can come right now and we together stand and sing. At last indeed I say
Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. And I think I just bring my communion cup up. <laughs> Can somebody bring me one? Can you sit down? But uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, teach us how to remember our Lord and Savior on the first day of the week. It states, for I receive of the Lord, and which also I deliver unto you. The same I do with the trade to cut bread. Now for giving thanks, he break it. But take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same manner, we also took the cup. We have such the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This you do also in the groups of me. So I will eat this bread, drink this cup. Reduce till my death until I come. Let's pray for the bread. In the Father, we thank you for this bread, which represents your body, this cup, which represents your blood. We thank you for the pain and suffering you went through for us. They will take this in a worthy manner under you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This concludes this part of the service. Yeah.